Hello and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving over the 100,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM's members. I'm Aaron Elmore, currently a postdoctoral associate at MIT, working with Mike Stonebreaker on Elastic and Multi-Database Systems, and Sam Madden on the Collaborative Data Analytic Platform, Data Hub. Beginning this June, I'll be an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Chicago. My research interests include elastic systems, database multi-tenancy, cloud computing, and simplifying data management for other scientific domains. I'm also co-chair for the Sigma 2016 demonstrations track. You can find more about me in the bio windows on your screen. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. Sorry, it's a little bit slow moving to the next screen. So before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items on the slide in front of you. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event, a little bit slower than just happened. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of widgets and resources. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command plus R if you're on a Mac, or refresh your browser if you're on a mobile device or close and relaunch the presentation. If that doesn't work, try rebooting your computer. To control the volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for questions. Please type your question into the Q&A box at any time and click on the Submit button. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it is available and check learning.acm.org in a few days for updates. You can also use Facebook and Twitter, the widgets on the bottom panel, to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag ACMWebinarFast. We'll be watching for your tweets. Today's presentation, The Fast Data Challenge and Picking the Right Database, Why One Size Doesn't Fit All, is by Michael Stonebreaker and John Hug. Michael Stonebreaker is the recipient of the 2014 ACM AM Turing Award, known as the Nobel Prize of Computing. Mike's Turing lecture will be June 14th in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Stonebreaker has been a pioneer of database research and technology for more than a quarter of a century. He was the main architect of the Ingress Relational Database Management System and the Object Relational Database Postgres. More recently at MIT, he was a co-architect of the Aurora Borealis Stream Processing Engine, commercialized as Streambase, the C-Store Column-Oriented Database, commercialized as Vertica, and the H-Store Transaction Processing Engine commercializes VoltDB. Currently, he is working on various aspects of quote-unquote big data. He is the co-founder of six venture capital-backed startups. John Hug is a software developer at VoltDB. He has spent his entire career working with databases and information management. In 2008, he was lured away from a PhD program by Mike Stonebreaker to work on what became VoltDB. As the first engineer on the product, he has liaised with teams of academics at MIT, Yale, and Brown who are building HDOR, VoltDB's research prototype. Then he helped build the world-class engineering team at VoltDB to continue development of the open source and commercial products. Mike, John, we look forward to your presentation here today. Okay. Uh, thanks, Aaron. That was a, I didn't realize you were such an orator. Uh, and uh, ACM should, uh, you know, make their marketing materi materials a little more, you know, casual. Okay, so today we are going to talk about uh, fast data. Fast data is a marketing term that, Volt, that VoltDB thought up. These are just high message rate systems. And so we're going to talk about what they look like. Uh, we're, and then we're going to talk about a bunch of ways to address high message rate, rate applications. We'll talk about some things that don't look like they're going to work. Uh, we'll talk about Volt uh, a little bit. And then we'll talk about, uh, or John will talk about the Lambda architecture solution. So that's what you have to, uh, to look forward to for the next hour. I want to just stress that this is not my Turing Award lecture. Uh, this is basically about uh, fast data. And my Turing Award lecture, the, the tentative title is called The Land Sharks Are on the Squawk Box, Why Building Postgres and Riding a Tandem Bicycle Across America Have a Lot in Common. So that'll be June 14th 
in Portland, Oregon. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so what, what a, where do high message rate applications come from? Uh, so who, who is upstream from all these messages? Uh, sometimes it's humans. Uh, so for example, if you're a World of Warcraft craft enthusiast, as uh, one of my close friend's son is, uh, then uh, basically this managing the state of any such uh, massively multiplayer game is a huge message rate application. Producing analytics from that message stream, things like producing leaderboards, uh, this is all uh, message rates that are coming from users' clicks. Uh, fast data also comes from the Internet of Things. Uh, it's well you know, well understood by now that essentially everything of commercial significance is going to be sensor tagged to report its state or location in real time. Uh, Waze is simply a current example of, uh, of somebody who, who uses your cell phone to generate real time geopositioning and use that to uh, get you through Boston traffic. So uh, the fast, high message rates come from the Internet of Things, they come from humans, and they may well come from both places. So stock market transactions, one thing I didn't really realize was that uh, electronic trading systems generate about 99% of the stock market transaction, uh, transaction rate, but the other 1% comes from humans doing data entry. So fast data comes from wherever it comes from and may well come from other places in the future. And so the question is, uh, how high a message rate uh, are we talking about? Uh, and here, if you want to run 10 messages a second, you know, don't bother, you know, make do something more useful with the next hour because 10 messages a second can be run on your cell phone. If you want to run a thousand messages a second, uh, a relational database system, one of the conventional legacy ones that I affectionately call uh, coming from the elephants, use whatever, most anything can do a thousand transactions a second. However, if you want to go fast, meaning you've got to process a hundred thousand uh, messages a second, now it gets really interesting. And I will use the word transaction and message interchangeably because in this world that's pretty much uh, a message equals a transaction. So we're going to talk about trying to go fast, uh, meaning high multiple thousands of transactions a second. And if you don't need to do that and you know you're never going to need to do that, again, go do something better with the next hour of, of your time. Next slide. So if you want to go fast, uh, the next few slides have a bunch of requirements. The first one is obviously you need to keep up. And one of the things in, in uh, Wall Street, uh, the increasing transaction rate of uh, Wall Street trading has been breaking the infrastructure of a lot of the major money center banks. And so what you want to do is as your volume goes up, you want to be able to keep up. So keep up now and keep up off into the future. So if you want to keep up and you're currently doing 10,000 messages a second and next year, let's say you're an internet startup, you everyone anticipates the hockey stick of growth. So next year you want to do 100,000. Uh, you certainly don't want to get put in the position that Facebook got put in, which is initially, uh, they said, well, let's just put the state in MySQL. Somebody knows that. And then the hockey stick of growth came, and oh, my God, they, uh, they're they now sharding in application code uh, probably around 10,000 ways. Anyway, you want to run a system that can automatically scale out because if you don't, then you are going to be sharding in user code and as it's, uh, I, I am on record for saying that's a fate worse than death. So, uh, so anyway, so don't deal with anything that can't scale out because you're going to face growth in the future. And then avoid pokey products. So just for example, uh, later on we'll talk about uh, a product that I'll call product number one. 
if it can execute a thousand messages a second, let's talk about another product, product two. If it can execute 25,000 messages a second, both of these numbers are per core. Then if you've got to do uh, 100,000 messages a second, it's going to take you four cores on product one, and it's going to take you 100 cores on product two. So the question is, would you rather run four cores or 100 cores? Uh, obviously, any sane person would say, I'll choose four. Thank you very much. So just avoid products that are just fundamentally slow. Next slide. Now, this, this, since I'm a database guy, one of the adages that has been true since the 1970s, we all read Ted Codd's paper, and high-level languages are good. And writing in database assembler is bad. Writing in message assembler is just plain equally as bad. So make sure that you're coding your application in something that has as high a level language as possible. Uh, you want message-oriented SQL, which is you want SQL or something that's like SQL. And that needs to be augmented by windowing operations. And what that means is, is if you're the stock market geek, you want to do things like find the moving average of IBM stock, meaning every 10 trades, you want the moving the average over the last 10 trades. When you get in the 11th trade, you want uh, the average over trades 1 to 11 and so forth. So that's what's called windowing, average, uh, windowing operations. So high-level language augmented with windowing, up, uh, windowing uh, operations is what you want. Next slide. Now, in terms of staying up, I don't know anybody these days who is willing to take downtime. No, no one will take downtime. So it means that you need to have a high availability solution, so-called HA. Uh, that requires that you be able to fail over to a backup if you get uh, a node failure. So you need to do real-time failover as well as when you put the dead machine back online, you want to be able to restore your original environment. Well, Tandem pioneered this about 30 years ago, and since I have a bunch of gray hair, I was actually around at the time. So you want Tandem-style uh, high availability. If you don't get that, then every once in a while, uh, your, your data message stream is just going to go blank you're going to develop amnesia, and I don't know anybody who wants to do that. Next slide. Now, if, if you care about your message stream, if, if your message stream is reporting uh, you know, on what your favorite dessert was or what you ate for breakfast, you know, that's not very important. But most people's message streams actually mean a lot. And so, a requirement is never lose my data. So it is unacceptable to lose my standing on the leaderboard. You know, if you all of a sudden forget that I'm on the on the on the top of the leaderboard, I will put my fist through the machine and through your application in the process. Uh, it's clearly unacceptable to lose my airline reservation. And so if you care about your data, you want a solution that will make sure that you never lose it. So it's unacceptable to drop messages on the floor. Uh, and so do, don't use any system that will drop messages on the floor for you. Uh, my favorite example of this is I talked about my friend's son, who's a World of Warcraft aficionado. He lent his account to his brother who did something that apparently is not acceptable on World of Warcraft, and they turned his account off. And my, my friend, uh, who, who is a computer science faculty member, called up the CEO of World of Warcraft and got him to turn the account back on. But when he turned it back on, he'd lost all of his special powers and he was back to square one, which was, of course, not what he wanted. So that's an example of losing my state. So never lose my state, never lose my messages. Next slide. Now, lots of you have requirements for data consistency. So, for example, if you are somebody who's ordering stuff 
from an online retail site. Uh, lots, some of the time you can take Amazon's policy, which is to say usually ships within 24 hours. That doesn't mean they have it in stock. Uh, usually means not always. But in a bunch of cases, it is just unacceptable to sell something that's not in stock. So uh, overbooking uh, on airlines beyond a certain number is just not acceptable. So that requires you to have data consistency. Uh, and for sure, if I'm doing a money transfer between account A and account B, well, that's basically a message to, uh, to the first account saying decrement yourself, message to the second account saying increment yourself. You want both of those messages processed or neither of them processed. If one of them is processed, then you're out the size of the transfer and you get an inconsistent database. You've just donated some money to the bank. So this requires what are called standard uh, transactions. In, the, in database lingo, that goes under the word ACID. So for those of you who know what ACID means, uh, great. If you don't know what ACID means, it means make sure my data is consistent when you're processing a flood of messages. Next slide. Now, if you want to do high availability, and my assumption is everyone does, uh, then you have a problem, which is if you, if you get a node failure, then you've got to fail over to a replica. So you've got to have data replication. And the problem is your replica has to be consistent with the primary. So, so the primary fails, you fail over to a backup. Backup has to look identical to the primary, because otherwise you lose my airline reservation or uh, or, you know, I, I bought the last widget in the primary, I fail over to a replica. The replica didn't get my transaction, it still thinks there's a widget there, it sells it to Aaron, and you've got, you've sold the last widget to multiple customers. So you can't do that. So in the case of replicas, which you need, you still need transactions uh, between your primary data and your replicas. So you need ACID on, on transaction, i.e. transactions uh, on your replicas. And we don't have time to really go through this, but I just want to point out that eventual consistency does not do this, fundamentally does not do this. Event, I can construct lots of examples where eventual consistency actually means creates garbage. So uh, demand the gold standard, which is standard transactions, both uh, inside your message stream and between uh, primary and replicas. So that's what you what that's what you want. Keep up, scale out, uh, support HA. Uh, and get acid on both primary data and replicas. So I'm now going to talk about some solutions. It's easy to dismiss a couple of solutions as non-solutions. The first one is traditional uh, enterprise relational database systems, uh, Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, dot, 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 dot. So in a slide or two, I will tell you why those are non-solutions. And then uh, all of the NoSQL products, popular ones include Cassandra, Mongo, dot, dot, dot. So I'll explain to you why uh, that's a non-solution. So two big classes of products are non-solutions. So to tell you why relational database systems are a non-solution, uh, I want to just summarize a paper that a bunch of us wrote back in 2009, which is, or maybe it was 2008, a while ago. Uh, if you put all your data in main memory and you start running, you start running SQL and you're running transactions, uh, it turns out that uh, overhead is 90% of the path length, not 
not figuring out that Aaron is some somebody you want to update and then giving him an update. That takes less than 10% of the total time. What takes the time is coordinating the disk-based buffer pool. Uh, all of the major relational database systems do dynamic locking. That requires a bunch of overhead. Uh, everybody has drank, has drunk the Kool-Aid from an IBM researcher named C. Mohan. Uh, he, is, he has written down the gold standard of write-ahead logging, a system called ARIES. Uh, the overhead of ARIES is substantial. And then multi-threading is, is a topic that's currently getting a lot of air, air time. It's expensive because if you it requires latches. If I have to wait on a latch, then I'm getting nothing done. In aggregate, these four things chew up order 90% of your machine resources. So that means that conventional next, Conventional disk-based relational database systems are just plain slow. And so, so they are limited to a few thousand transactions per second because of their algorithms for doing these four kinds of services, which are all, all came from the 1980s. So if you know you never need to go more than a few thousand transactions a second, messages a second, then have at it, use, use a relational database system. If there's some possibility you need to go faster, then you will hit a very, very solid wall uh, that you're then going to have to deal with in application logic. This is what causes Facebook to have to shard MySQL some 10,000 ways, a fate worse than death. So relational database systems work fine. They're just plain slow. Next slide. So NoSQL systems. Well, the first thing about NoSQL systems is they give you sort of message assembler. They give you a low-level language where you've got to describe the algorithm for processing everything. And, uh, and that means that you write much more code than if you get some high-level language like SQL. So message assembler, database assembler, it's basically been dismissed by the community as a whole many, many years ago. Uh, NoSQL is a return to the time of the 1970s. Second thing about NoSQL is you get no asset. And so you do not get transactions, and uh, you can lose data. You can lose data on replication. Uh, so it's low-level services, low-level language, and no transactions. And the systems are also slow because buffer pool and multi-threading overhead are still there. So you get the worst of all worlds. You get low performance and low function, uh, not something I would recommend. Next slide. So in my opinion, there are two things that, two solutions that make a lot better sense. The first one is to run a high-performance main memory SQL ACID DBMS. And there are a bunch of them on the market. Uh, VoltDB sells one. Hecaton, which is a piece of SQL Server 14, is another uh, exemplar of a SQL main memory ACID DBMS. HANA is, uh, in their roadmap, is to move HANA to be a similar kind of engine. So there's a bunch of solutions that are basically SQL ACID uh, high-performance engines. Second thing that you can do is run a what I call complex event processing system, CEP. Uh, Storm is probably the most popular one these days, but there's been a, a bunch in the past. Uh, Streambase is another exemplar of a CEP engine. So those are seemingly the two games in town. So next slide. Let me just give you two quick examples to show what's good at what. So here's a, a, an example from a, a typical hedge fund who's doing uh, electronic well, trading Wall Street style. So they're looking for patterns in a trading stream. So. Find me a strawberry followed within five milliseconds by a banana, followed within 10 milliseconds by a grape. 
So find me a situation where IBM went, went up by a certain amount and Oracle went down by a certain amount and so forth. So the, you're looking for a complex pattern in a fire hose and CEP systems are a natural for this style of application. Next slide. However, uh, here's a second uh, example from an electronic trading system. Uh, there is a very large uh, electronic trading system that has trading, electronic trading desks all over the world. And what they want to do is maintain the global state of their enterprise for or against uh, long or short for every stock that they trade. So a message comes in saying Hong Kong sold five shares of IBM. You want to simply update the state of uh, your position uh, for IBM by that, those five shares. And then their whole idea is this is a risk mitigation system. If, they, if their position gets too risky, uh, then the C CFO wants to pull the plug. So ring the red telephone if there's too much risk. And for goodness sakes, don't ever lose any of my messages, because that means that the state I'm keeping is now wrong. So this is one where there's a big state to keep, and the messages simply update a substantial state, and you're going to run analytics on that state. So this is a sweet spot for SQL-style ACID main memory DBM assets. Next slide. <clears throat> so CEP is a natural when, you, when you're looking for lots of patterns and you're not trying to keep track of stuff. Uh, main memory SQL engines are a natural where you're trying to keep track of a lot of stuff, but the patterns aren't, aren't, very, aren't nearly as important. So essentially all real-time analytic applications are in the second category, which is you're trying to keep track of the state and then run some analytics on it. So the anecdotal evidence is that there are, there are three or four of the problems in the second category for every one in the first category. So God's on my side. Uh, there are more problems in my bucket than in the CEP bucket. So VoltDB is fundamentally, at, fundamentally addresses uh, the you know, second bucket, which is you're interested in SQL, you're interested in main memory, you want a scale-out solution to as many nodes as you're interested in, and you want very, very high uh, performance. So figure around numbers, uh, 30, 40,000 messages per core uh, per second. So you can get a huge amount done with a not, not terrifically big configuration. The other thing that database guys believe in is ACID. Uh, Volt gives you pure ACID. It gives you... For those of you who know what this means, it gives you pure serializability with a lot of detailed trickery uh, that I won't talk about. It gives, if you have local replications on, uh, replicas on a local cl cluster, it gives you acid across those replicas with a bunch more trickery that I'm not going to talk about. It also uh, supports replicas that are on the other end of a wide area network. We're happy to give you ACID on a WAN, but our customers, by and large, don't want it. No one's willing to pay the latency that that entails. So you can have ACID on remote replicas if you want, if you're willing to pay uh, the latency. So that's what Volt does. Volt is really good at uh, real-time analytics, problems where there's big state, a little pattern, which, in my opinion, is most of the market. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Hug, and he's going to trash the opposition, as near as I can tell. Hi. Uh, so th thanks a lot, Mike. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a fast data example, uh, which is you know one fast data example out of out of many, but it maybe can help ground this problem a little bit and, and show you a little bit about how VoltDB uh, compares to some other solutions. So talking about uh, VoltDB and the Lambda architecture, uh, Lambda architecture is one sort of set of, set of patterns, set of tools to, to solve this sort of fast data problem. Um, and, and we're going to look a little bit about how Volt specifically compares to that. 
so, so what is Lambda for those who aren't, aren't familiar? And, you know, there's certainly a lot of resources online if you're interested in this. Um, Lambda basically says, look, you know, batch processing is pretty well understood. It's fairly robust. We can process a lot of data. We can do a lot of interesting things with that data. Uh, but we can't do it with any reasonable latency. Uh, it's, it's not a fast system. It's a, it's a I can do it, but I eventually. Uh, on the other hand, um, problems where, where latency is important, stream processing, uh, things where you want to make decisions as, as the data actually is mutating, as the event is actually happening, uh, they have very different requirements than batch processing, and that space is a lot less mature. Uh, it's, it's mostly because the data, uh, because it's not at rest, it's moving between different systems, it's being transformed, it's being processed. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to keep track of the data, to manage things and failures. Uh, it, essentially, you know, most of the solutions out there are, are, are complex, complex, less robust, uh, and, and prone to user failure in addition to a system or hardware failure. So what the Lambda architecture says is, you know, it, I accept both of these things. Uh, and I'm going to do both at the same time in order to, to compensate for both, both sides. I'm going to use the, the stream processing to get my immediate responses, but I'm going to use batch processing to make sure those responses are right. It may take some time to make sure those responses are right, but you know, over time I can get a fast answer and I can ensure that I have a correct answer and, and a historical answer. So, so what does an example Lambda stack look like? Um, this is an example Lambda stack from somebody who's actually using this technology. Um, they're doing ingestion with Kafka, which is a very, very uh, more and more common thing these days. Uh, and they're, they're splitting that Kafka stream into two layers, the speed layer and the batch layer per, per Lambda. So in the speed layer, they, they have Storm and Cassandra, uh, Storm for processing, doing distributed processing, and Cassandra for managing distributed state. And in the batch layer, they're using uh, Amazon S3, uh, Elastic, MapReduce, and, and, and Cascading uh, to, to do the same computations they're doing in the speed layer, but in, in a batch-oriented way, in, in a more persistent way than they're using the speed layer for. And, and all these services are coordinated by Zookeeper. So these are, you know, kind of seven tools, and, uh, you know, an actual customer is using uh, different, different use cases, different uh, users might switch out some of these tools for different ones. There are a lot of different combinations you can build. Um, but this is, this is certainly one example, and it's not, not atypical. So let's take a look at a specific problem uh, that you could use this architecture to solve. Uh, say I, I make a mobile app, and this app runs on phones, tablets, whatever, and, and what I want to know is how many people use my app today. That's kind of the, qu the question that, that, uh, that I, I'm tasked with solving as an engineer. So one, one thing is how many, sort of to formalize that problem, is how many unique users interacted with my app today, or how many unique devices uh, use my app today. And, and what we can do with the Lambda architecture is, is answer this problem as a service for many app developers. So the app developer is going to include some code. And that code is going to, when the user launches an app, it's going to send to, to some application somewhere in the cloud, some service, an identifier of the application and identifier of the device. Just a little tuple of, of two pieces of information. And the cloud is going to compute uh, how many people, how many unique people or unique devices have used that app today. So this is a problem that, that you can solve with Lambda architecture. This is a problem you can solve with VoltDB. Um, and I will say uh, that this is also a problem that uh, you can download the VoltDB kit from our website. And all the code to solve this problem, our example app, is, is right in there in the examples folder if you download our kit. So everything I'm going to show you uh, from the VoltDB side today is something that you can download and run your stuff yourself. You can inspect the code. Um, it, it's, it's all totally public. So why can't I do this uh, in my SQL? Or why is this a, a challenging problem? So let, let's say I'm, I'm the company that's, that's providing this service to app developers. Um, I, I might have a million different app ID, device ID pairs per second coming in. I might have a billion mobile app users that I have to differentiate between coming in. So the naive way to do this is simply keep a, a database somewhere that keeps track of all these individual users and which apps they've used today and when new messages come in, do lookups. 
the problem is that as, as the number of users and as the number of apps and as the number of, of times things have opened increase to these, these very high rates that we're talking about with mobile devices, with the Internet of Things, with sensor data, with all the you know, stock data and ad serving data, all the data streams that, that products like VoltDB and the Lambda architecture look at, uh, at this rate, this becomes really expensive uh, to solve this way naively. So, so one of the things people do is they turn to probabilistic data structures. So probabilistic data structures um, are, are great ways to trade a little bit of accuracy for, for a tremendous efficiency in terms of processing uh, speed and processing storage. So hyperloglog log is, is the one we're going to use uh, for this particular application. This is used in the Lambda architecture. Uh, the example, uh, the example uh, stack that I showed on the previous slide, um, it's used in the VoltDB example that you can download. There's code for this. You don't necessarily need to understand how hyperloglog log works. It's really fascinating if you want to look into it. Uh, if you're not aware, it's, it's, a, it's a neat technology. It's not particularly complicated. Uh, but the idea is that for, for a fixed set of space per app and a fixed CPU cost per app, uh, it can tell you uh, with a bounded accuracy how many unique uh, users have used your app. Or if you show it, for example, a string of, of integers, it can tell you with bounded accuracy how many unique integers are in that stream. So for a few kilobytes of blobs stored in, in VoltDB uh, or, or in Cassandra or in some other system, uh, I can get 99% accuracy on, on how many unique uh, device IDs are in that blob. So what does the app look like in VoltDB? You know, we said that the, the app identifier and the device ID are sent to the service. Um, it's sent to a, a VoltDB cluster. The, the message is routed to a VoltDB server, and it's run in a, in a procedure. Uh, we're going to call it count device estimates here. And, and the procedures that ingest it um, are, are a mix of Java and SQL. So this may be similar to the storm uh, stack that was seen before. It could be, that could be a mix of Java and, and, and uh, Cassandra CQL or, or something of that nature. Um, it's really straightforward to read. You don't have to understand a complicated procedure language. If you're familiar with Java, it's not the most complex Java in the world. Mostly, you know, people use if statements and loops. Um, and you interact with SQL and, and, and result sets from SQL statements. Uh, so this stored procedure operates on, on a state, uh, on an estimates relation or an estimates table that has uh, four values in it. Uh, an app ID, which application is it? Uh, a device count, which is the current estimate for that application for the day. Uh, and a hyperloglog log blob, which is basically the, the bytes that, that we're using to, do, to compute that estimate. Uh, this table is partitioned uh, horizontally on, on the app ID so that we can add apps and we can scale horizontally. Uh, and, and we've got a rank index on the actual computed estimate so that we can, uh, we can get top tens and other things. We'll look into that a little bit more as we go. So kind of an overview of pseudocode of what this thing does. In the stored procedure, we've got a hyperloglog log library. This is some third-party code that's in our example that you can download uh, that does hi generic hyperloglog log operations. Uh, so what the VoltDB stored procedure code does is it finds the row in, in, in the database for this particular app ID, um, and it will use the hyperloglog log library uh, to, to update basically the, the blob stored in that row uh, with a new device ID that it, that's come in, or perhaps it's not new. That, that's kind of the point. Um, and then it will use the hyperloglog log library to compute the current estimate. So what is the current estimate for this app? Then it's going to store the new blob, um, that's seen this device ID and the new estimate, uh, which may or may not have changed, directly back into the table. So our state estimates table looks something like app ID 12, might have an 86 as the estimate, um, and it's got a blob tacked on the end. App ID 21 may have 17 users today, and it's got a blob tacked onto the end. So here is code uh, that we're going to walk through that's actually the, the code for the sto stored procedure. And there's lots of you know, documentation on what the individual syntax is. We're going to do this at a little bit of a high level today. Um, but declared at the top are the SQL statements we're going to use. There's just two, and they're very simple. Uh, we have a, a SQL statement that's a select to find the row for a particular app ID. And then we have a SQL statement that's an upsert. And an upsert is basically either an insert or an update, depending on whether the primary key exists. So it's, it's very much like an insert uh, or a replace. 
So upsert into estimates, and, and then those are taking the new values. So this is, you know, very vanilla SQL, although, you know, certainly you can run very complex SQL with aggregates and joins and, and all kinds of uh, interesting things, you know, if, you're, if you want to build more, more complicated procedures. For this one, we don't need it that much. So uh, the parameters to this stored procedure are here, the, the app ID and, and a prehashed device ID. Those are what come in. The first thing we do is we look for the, a, an existing row for that app ID, uh, which we may or may not have. If this is the first time we've seen this app for the day, uh, then we won't have it, but typically we will. Uh, the next thing is we construct an instance of the hyperlog log um, based on the existing row, if we have one, the blob that's there, or we could construct a new one if there's no blob there at all. We offer to the hyperlog log a new hash device ID or an existing hash device ID. We don't know. The hyperlog log uh, only knows with 99% accuracy, uh, but it will then update its internal bytes with, with that number. Um, and in the last section here, we're going to do our upsert, and the parameters to our upsert uh, are the last three parameters to that Volt QSQL line. The, the app ID, which hasn't changed, uh, a new computed hyperlog log cardinality, um, and, and the, the new bytes of the hyperlog log. So what are the advantages of doing this kind of thing in Volt? Um, well, there, there's a lot, and I'll touch on some of them. One thing is that uh, you can build systems with Volt that are less complex operationally. Uh, so, so Volt, what it does in this, in this fast data world is it, it's got built-in agreement uh, which is typically handled by Zookeeper in, in the Lambda stack. It's got built-in ingestion tools that are typically handled by Kafka, and it's got built-in processing tools, distributed processing with, with uh, high availability um, and, and, and acid guarantees, and that's something that typically is done by Storm uh, with fewer guarantees in the Lambda stack. And it's got a distributed state and very, very high velocity state with, with SQL, with very traditional access, but with a lot of interesting features we've added um, like document storage and things uh, to make it uh, more 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 mo modern kind of system uh, that's typically handled by Cassandra in, in you know this particular app. Although you know people in the Lambda stack use lots of different data stores. Cassandra is just the example in the stack. Um, I, I will make a note about Kafka. Uh, you know Kafka is something that's sort of everywhere these days, and Bolt is uh, very good at ingestion on its own, but it also is very good at we're playing with Kafka. We've got native Kafka ingesters. So if you want, you can have your, your system ingest into Kafka and then push that into VoltDB. Um, that's something that is often kept around even, even in VoltDB apps. So now that, that's certainly, you know, the ops picture is there's, there's fewer moving pieces. But uh, from, a, from a developer picture, I think that's where a lot, even more value comes from. So, so certainly uh, I can write less code using VoltDB. I can leverage the strong consistency, the ACID properties of, of these Volt stored procedures. The fact that the state and the agreement and the processing are integrated means that I have fewer ways that things can fail separately. Uh, I have fewer use edge cases I need to worry about when I'm building my application to be robust. I can code assuming that I'm the only one who's modifying that data at a particular point of time. I don't have to worry about concurrent access. That's why that code I showed you basically the pseudocode is I need to do four things. The actual code is I've got, you know, four bits of code um, that looks very much like that. There's almost no error handling in there, and that's not because it's an example. That's because that, that transaction is either going to completely succeed or completely roll back. And you may need some, some uh, code in your, in your um, client to handle some certain error conditions, but also if you notice that that, that operation is completely idempotent as well. If you send the device ID uh, by accident or on purpose multiple times, um, if you're using at least once delivery from a message queue, uh, you're not going to get a different answer as, as you uh, send more things. And that's, that's another nice property of the uh, acid stored procedures. Um, so other things that you can do here, uh, the hyperlog log code is completely used by the stored procedure. And that's another way that we're different from a lot of the other data stores. So because the hyperlog log code is completely used by the stored procedure, the, uh, it, the clients using it don't have to know anything about that. They can select the app ID device count from estimates, order by device count descending, limit 10. That's just SQL for get me the top 10 apps. Um, and they don't have to know anything about the hyperlog log to read the data. In a lot of other systems, the client would also have to know how to process the hyperlog log, or you'd have to materialize that answer. But Volt can do it in real time. 
Um, and not mentioned here necessarily, but uh, your code is also more flexible. If I wanted to go in and change that procedure so that it was an exact count up to 1,000 um, and then uh, a estimate after 1,000, um, that's really not that hard to do. And you don't have to change the client code at all. The client code can remain exactly the same. We actually have examples of an exact counter, a hybrid uh, exact and, and estimate counter, and the, the pure estimate counter in the hyperlog log, sorry, in the uh, unique devices app that we ship with our product that you can take a look at. So now we're going to show a demo of this app. All right, here I am in the unique devices directory. The first thing I'm going to do is start VoltDB. I do that with the VoltDB create command. Oops. And I start it in the background. Okay, my server is started. I'm going to check that started successfully. Excellent, that's the output I want to see. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is load my DDL. So I'm going to use the SQL command tool that Volt packages, and I'm going to pipe in the ddl.sql file that is in this directory. Okay, so. Now I'm going to go look at the Volt Management Center. This is something that's new in 5.0. And we're going to take a look at the schema tab at the top. And you can see schema, procedures. Uh, you can size how big your database is going to be. Uh, here we are. I can look at the tables. Here's the estimates table. And this is what stores my app ID, my device count, and the hyperlog log var binary structure. Uh, you can see from here. Uh, procedures that use this table, count device estimate is, is the one that we're interested in. Um, I can look at indexes defined on the table. I'm going to click on count device estimate. It's going to take me to the procedures in SQL tab. And then I can see count device estimate, this procedure that's loaded, uh, how it's partitioned, what its parameters are. Uh, I can even look at the SQL that it contains. And for any particular SQL statement, I can click uh, to expand it and show the plan for that SQL query. Uh, so this is a great tool to learning all about procedures, schema, everything about your database. Um, I can go back to the DB monitor. And you can see that right now the CPU, the amount of RAM, uh, and the transactions per second is very low. So let's start some work. So to do that, I'm going to run a script that comes with the example called run.sh. Here's the client. So I'm starting the benchmark. It's running about 60,000 calls to that procedure per second on this laptop. Uh, certainly it's a lot faster on, on a uh, server. So I can see here that now my, where my latency, my cluster throughput is 67,000 transactions per second. You can see which stored procedures I'm calling here in the Volt Management Center. Uh, so here's you know 1.8 million invocations, and that number is climbing every time this refreshes. This shows me uh, procedures that are being called, how many rows are in tables, a lot of information that's really useful when you're trying to understand how your app is performing. I highly recommend checking out BMC. So that's the example. Uh, it's really easy to run. When I want to stop it, I can just hit Control C, um, and Volt DB stop will stop my database. And now this was done with full durability. So if I type Volt DB recover, it will replay. Uh, it will reload the snapshot and replay any any logs uh, and bring you back to exactly where. Okay, so. Uh... If you want to celebrate, Mike, we've got a, a commemorative Stonebreaker Turing Award t-shirt. If you're interested, you can follow that link, uh, send us an address, and we're going to send you uh, a copy of that t-shirt. Thank you, guys. So we've got a bunch of good questions. The first question, John, why don't you answer here? Uh, we had a lot of questions asking about VoltDB, Apache St Spark, and Apache Storm. Can you talk about the differences between them and which one should the user think about using in which scenario? Okay. Um, 
Well, uh, there's definitely a lot of synergy uh, between some of the, the fast data processing that Bolt does and some of the um, batch processing or deeper exploration that can be possible with something like Spark. Uh, so that's something that, you know, we, we have users who are, who are moving data uh, through Volt DB as a fast side and then doing, doing sort of historical analysis or, or, or deeper uh, analysis in uh, systems like Spark or in systems like analytic data stores or in other Hadoop ecosystem tools. Uh, so we have a real, uh, we have a native integration with a, a sort of an export to HDFS so that you can uh, control how data moves to HDFS out of VoltDB. And that's, that's a big integration point for us. We also have systems that, that you know, there's an example you can download from Volt that shows uh, Volt running, exporting to HDFS, HDF, Hadoop ecosystem tools feeding data back into Volt for, for sort of a complete loop. Uh, so I think that, that, that that's sort of where our, our real interest in Synergy lie. Um, there's also, you know, Storm is, is, as a stream processing app and, and uh, systems like Spark Streaming, uh, which is more of a stream-focused uh, system. It's really, a, I mean, almost a talk in itself to kind of go into comparing these things. There's, there's a lot of differences. Uh, Storm certainly is, is, does a lot less than what Volt does. It's more of a, you know, I'm going to give you some Java code that you can run on these tuples in a distributed way. Um, but there, you know, there's certainly a lot of flexibility there. And, you know, it's not mutually exclusive to VoltDB, but a lot of the things you can do with Storm, you can also do with Volt. Um, especially a lot of what the very common things, which is sort of real-time analysis, aggregations, uh, counting, those things are, are very easy to do in Volt. Okay, thanks. Mike, here's a question for you. What is your opinions of the RAM database called 10X? <clears throat> Times 10, sorry. Oh, times 10. <clears throat> I was going to say 10x is a new one to me. Uh, so times 10 is, is an Oracle product that is that was written in the 90s, uh, and it's a main memory database system. But one thing you should always think about when you think about any database product is go back to my four sources of overhead. <clears throat> so that is buffer pool, you know, dynamic locking, uh, write-ahead logging, and multi-threading. So times 10 gets rid of the buffer pool because it's a main memory database system. However, it does record-level dynamic locking. That piece of the overhead is still there. It does multi-threading. That piece of the overhead is still there. And it does standard uh, Mohan-style, Aries-style logging. So that piece of the overhead is still th there. So one of these four slices of pie goes away, the remaining three remain. So it's not a very high performance system. To really go fast, you have got to have a much lighter weight version of all four of these pieces of pie. Great. I think this question will be good for both people to have John answer first. So some argue that ACID cannot scale. Can you compare eventual consistency in the real world versus volt ACID? Yeah, I mean, I think that... Uh the consistency model is, is one thing to take into account when you're looking at, at scaling things. Uh, but in, in practice, you know, there are certainly examples of really huge systems that, that don't use eventual consistency. Um, we have some customers that scale to tremendous throughput. Um, we're using, obviously, what, what is an ACID serializable consistent system. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, if you look at Google, a lot of the work they've done on, on, on some of their, their F1 papers and their... Uh, some of the stuff they've done, they have a real push towards more consistent systems. They've said explicitly in some of their papers that they find that a lot of the eventual consistency work puts a too big a burden. It makes it not worth it on the customers. Um, so I think that, sorry, on the customers being the, the users at Google who use those systems. Um, I think that it, it uh, you know, if you, if you certainly, if you look at scaling at any level, it's not easy, right? If you have tremendous scale, um, then you're going to do some work to make your solution work. Uh, you know, at Volt, what we want to do is we want to give you the tools to make you know, Volt the, the, the least bad solution. Um, and I say that sort of a little tongue-in-cheek, but you know, as somebody who's built these tools, that, that definitely is the way I look at it. You know, it it's work to make a system successful, but uh, we want to give you the tools that's going to be the least surprising um, and, and the, the most straightforward way to do that. Okay. Mike, part of the follow-up question for you here is, in what sense does eventual consistency create garbage? And isn't it useful for many applications? And then also, what are your thoughts about uh, conflict-free replicated data types, the CRDTs? Okay. So, so first of all, I just want to 
uh, add a little item to what uh, Je uh, to what John Hugg said. So one of the big proponents of eventual consistency was Jeff Dean of Google. Uh, and you should all read his Spanner paper from a couple years ago. He basically said, I was wrong. Eventual consistency is not what Google customers want. They want uh, real asset consistency. So just go, if, go, go read the Spanner paper for why uh, asset is good and eventual consistency is bad. The real answer to your question is suppose I have two, two updates. Update one gives uh, Aaron a 10% raise. Update two gives Aaron a $500 bonus. So the trouble with eventual consistency is you can, you can execute those two updates in one order on the primary and in a different order on the replica. So if you think about this for a minute, those two updates do not commute. And so if, you, if the order changes, you get a different answer on the primary than you get on the replica. So eventual consistency depends on uh, your transaction being reversible, meaning commutative. And if, you're, if your updates are not commutative, you create garbage. And so that's the answer is if you, if you have the special case where you know your updates are commutative, then it will work correctly. If you don't have that case, you are in deep yogurt. Great, Mike. Uh, John, are there any special considerations for high-rate geospatial temporal data, for example, the Waze data that has both real-time and historical space-time analytics? Um, I think that, I mean, certainly looking at, at geospatial data, I think that, that's something that, that you know, Volt is very interested in, and uh, it, it's it's an interesting space because there's you know it's one of the ways that you look at these Internet of Things sensor data. Is, you know, geospatial is certainly a component of that. Um, in in terms of it, a lot, there are a lot of things that you can do uh, with Volt because it's flexible, because uh, because the data model is flexible, because the, the the procedure logic is flexible. We can integrate third-party libraries. We've got examples of people who've used uh, who who've moved in. Uh, the, uh, some of the Google positioning libraries that they use for Google Earth. Uh, there's some other other tools that we've used, um, but it's it's an exciting uh, space. I don't know if there's necessarily as, as considerations that, that, that are specific. Okay. Well, I think put put differently, you know, if you have a terabyte or so of real time data, which is a lot, then if you're willing to to buy twenty five thousand dollars worth of main memory, you can put all of that in Bolt and run a traditional ACID SQL application. And, uh, and so I think, you know, that unless you have, unless, you're, unless your data is measured in tens of, of terabytes, a, ma a main memory database system is almost certainly the answer. Right. And so, John, are there any concerns with scaling up the size of the data affecting the high throughput rate? If we start to go towards petabytes of, of data, how, how can VoltDB work in that environment? Sure. Well, well VoltDB is, a, is an in-memory system focused on fast data. Now, that's not to say that it isn't use disk persistence, but it, it is, uh, the way it is architected to scale to the millions of operations per second, it relies on the fact that the, the data structures are tuned for memory performance. Uh, so, you know, what that means is that you're, you're not going to be putting, today anyway, petabytes of memory in VoltDB. You're going to be putting uh, small terabytes of memory in VoltDB. And that's where the, the synergy between, you know, VoltDB and analytic stores or VoltDB and HDFS and, and the ecosystem of, of, of tools that run on that um, really comes into play. There are a lot of systems we have where users have historical data in, in, in their analytical data stores uh, and, and their live data in VoltDB. And that's a, that's a model that works very well for a lot of the ingestion and processing. Mike, there were some questions earlier about your comment on WAN um, transactional systems. Can you expand on that a little bit? What are the challenges with WAN? How would a WAN system work with a system like VoltDB? Okay, so so again, I think if you're interested, uh, read read the Spanner paper from Google and Jeff Dean. So basically, Spanner is running perfect synchronous replicas over a wide area network, and they manage to do that because they control the entire end-to-end -end processing. They control, they control the switches, the routers. Uh, they control the uh, the wire from here to there. 
And so they have the entire end-to-end -end system, and by cleverly engineering everything, they can make the latency uh, of synchronous replicas uh, down into reasonable numbers of milliseconds. What our customers find is that uh, in order to make your replica synchronous, you've got to make sure that over there it gets your update and reliably tells you that it got your update before you can commit the local updates. So you've got to pay a round trip message from over here to over there. And uh, if it's from here to Chicago over public, uh, public data networks where you know, Verizon is running the routers and, and dot, 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 uh, latency can well be half a second and lots of people just are not willing to pay that kind of response time penalty to acknowledging an incoming message. So this is purely a latency issue, and this is purely technology, and it's purely how much how much of the end-to-end -end wire system do you actually control? Great. Last question. I'd like to put it to both of you. Um, let's talk about open source a bit. Mike, what was your inspiration and motivation to open source academic projects early on? Uh, I mean, way, way back when. Way right? back when. The, uh, the answer was both Ingress and Postgres were open source before open source was a word. And back then we were, you know, in the case of Ingress, we were interested in, you know, we, we were on a, you know, on a mission to make relational database systems the, you know, the accepted solution of the land. And you wanted to put that solution in, in as many hands as possible. And back then, everybody had to recompile their source code to get it to run on, on you know, you know, a, a new system. So it's just natural to give everyone everyone the source code. And I think so. The answer is we weren't really thinking about it. It just and I think it you you want to put software in in as many hands as possible as easily as possible so people can kick the tires. And I think you know Volt. Volt is consistent with that with that philosophy, and I think essentially all database systems, you know, starting in around 2007 or so, have been open source. So I think it, I think it's a wonderful model. The other reason it's a wonderful model these days is that uh, if if you decide to buy a database system from a proprietary vendor like Oracle, well, they send out a salesman. Uh, you know who who is only smart enough to take you to lunch, so he gets paired with a, a sales engineer who can answer your questions. So you get a four-legged sales team, and that's fundamentally expensive, which means that your software is expensive because you have a very expensive distribution model. And so open source is a wildly cheaper distribution model, and so it it just knocks down the price of software, and so it it just is goodness and all dimensions. So, John, to see what was your experience is kind of dealing with Volt's history of kind of having this open source project going on and dealing with the center, you know, academics like Andy Pavlo. How did you feel that pro that process worked for you? Oh, well, that was. I mean, I, I think most of that was uh, in the the summer of 2008, and that that was a it was certainly an exciting time because we were you know building everything from scratch. And I remember we went to a meeting with with Mike and uh, told him that we could do. Uh, one transaction a second, and then we came back a week later and said we could do ten thousand, and then we came back a week later and said you know it was it was a it was kind of you know that that birth was really fun and working with with a lot of really smart people uh, who had all kind of different things that brought them to the project was a lot of fun, and then building the team here you know transitioning from that it's, you know it's nice to still have those connections to those, those academics um, as we built a commercial team here uh, it's it's made the, the product a little bit special, I think. Great. So I think we've run out of time today. I'd like to thank Mike and John again for their informative presentation and insightful answers to the many questions. We'll try to get to many of the unanswered questions. We'll follow up with them um, offline here. So special thanks to everyone for taking the time to participate today. Um, we have a uh, webinar that will be recorded, obviously. It'll be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org slash webinar. You can find announcements about upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. 
Also, please fill out a quick survey, it should be on the screen here, where you can suggest future topics or speakers, and that should be on your screen now. So this is Aaron Elmore saying goodbye for now and stay classy. Thanks again for joining us. Hope you'll join us again in the future.